As we get into the book of Colossians, I just want a little backdrop here. Um, an interesting story for me when, uh, when I was in Haiti uh, two years ago, I was asked, this guy came and he asked me to come visit this hospital up in the mountains. And so he came and, and he came with this little tiny uh, Ford Ranger truck. And he said, uh, the, he said it's only about uh, 10, 10 miles up the mountain, but it'll probably take three hours to get there because there's no road. And so we were heading up, we were heading up this mountain, and he, he took a wrong turn. And so the, uh, it, it went on some really bad, like, rocky, rocky roads there. And when he was all done, when he brought us back to the hotel, we could see that the truck was actually, like, going down the street a little sideways. So we were like, hey, man, you might want to check, like, check your alignment, <laughs> you know, because it's going, it, it, your car actually looks like it's going sideways down the road. And, and we need that for all our cars. You know, it's every now and then you got to get the alignment checked so you're going smoothly down the road. And this is what Paul was doing to some of these uh, churches that he was riding. What they needed was just a little alignment adjustment. So because they, they had asked Paul, the, the pastor of, Col- of the church in Colossians, asked Paul some questions and saying, hey, I think we're getting off track just a little bit. And Paul was like, okay, I'm going to send you a letter, and hopefully we'll get the alignment together with your church there, and we'll get back on the right, right road. Because we all need that in life, too. Don't you ever need a life check where you're kind of like, man, I think I'm veering off the wrong way, and somebody could come along and just put you back where you need to be. Um, so they reached out, the pastor reached out to Paul, and uh, Paul sent this letter. But some of you might not even know who Paul is. Well, just a quick quick brief summary. Paul was a man who used to be named Saul. And when he was younger, uh, he fought against Christianity. He thought Christians were against God, what he believed in. And Saul or Paul at the time, they were, he was a very intelligent person. He had almost the entire Old Testament, pretty much the Old Testament memorized. And he was serving along some of the brightest teachers in Rome, uh, just learning so much about the Old Testament and the Torah and, the, and Hebrew and all these things and translations and stuff. And so when these Christians came along saying, hey, we found the Messiah, he was offended. And he was said, man, this is going against God. We got to st- Stop this. We got to take care of it. So he led the charge. Actually, he got permission uh, to take armies with him as he went into people's homes and he went into cities and he actually dragged Christians and separated them from their families. He was actually part of the people uh, that came and actually murdered Christians um, and killed them and tried to stop this message of Christ. And finally, it got to a point where he was he was on a road to Damascus and God showed up in his life and, and pretty much knocked him off his horse and and spoke to him and say, no, 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 listen, you're persecuting the real God. He had a moment with Jesus, and that changed his life forever. And when his life changed, everything about his life changed. He began promoting the gospel. He, he studied with the disciples for some time and went out and began promoting the gospel. And, and everywhere he went, that's just all he did. That was his mission. And while he was uh, writing to the church in Colossians, he never had been there before, but he had heard about this church. He had heard what they were doing, their works, the things that were happening there at the church. And so Paul was actually writing this letter from prison. So he was in jail, and it wasn't really a nice prison where, you know, in America, some people get cable TV and a college education and all those things like that. He was actually in a dungeon, chained to some other guards, writing this letter to this particular church. Uh, Paul was called an apostle, and that name came from... Uh, cargo ships called apostolic cargo ships. And what they were was they were specialty ships that weren't, they weren't cruise ships, they weren't anything special, but they brought uh, specialty goods to different places all across the world. And so this is what Paul did. Paul became an apostle and he brought the good news from one place uh, to another. Well, in the church of Colossians, they were having this issue that many of us happened to have. They were, they were a young church. They were a growing church. But one of the issues they were dealing with is now that they've discovered Jesus, they were trying to add a few things to that. It's kind of like saying, um, okay, I have Jesus and everything is great. And I understand he forgive my sins and I understand who he is. But if I can just have a couple other things, then I'll be happy. If I just add a couple, couple things into my life, then I will have everything, you know, that I ever wanted. And honestly, Paul was pretty much saying as a wrap of the whole book, he says, man, you don't know what you have in Jesus. 
If that's what you need, if you have to add other things, then you don't know what you have in Jesus. But listen, we all do this. We all know who Jesus is, feeling loved by him, and we just try to get something else that will make us happy. It could be a relationship with a boy or a girl. It could be, oh, this car. Man, if I have Jesus and this car, then I'll be happy. Or it could be whatever. It could be a change in career, all these things. If we're just saying, if this is what I had plus Jesus, then I will have everything. It's, it's, it's kind of like, I'll break it down even further. Um, uh, who do you guys, who is the richest person that you guys can think of off the top of your head? Who? Bill Gates. Who else? Anybody else? Who? Oh, Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett is estimated at, I think, uh, $42 billion. Bill Gates, I think, is at $55 billion. Something like that. $12 billion? Oh, oh, yeah. So just imagine, let's take uh, Warren Buffett, because he's, you know, he's, he's almost gone. And uh, he has, let's say he has $40 billion. And so you could say, if, if they gave you the $40 billion, and you go, okay, thank you for the $40 billion. So now that I have $40 billion, but if I could only have that guitar, then I'll be happy. Do you see how that doesn't make sense? It's like, God, uh, God just gave me $40 billion, but man, you know, it's still not enough. I, I just need to have that guitar right there. Then everything will be complete. This is what happens when you don't understand who you have in Christ, and, and you don't understand that, that who Christ is in your life. And I pray as a church and as a pastor that some of you will get to that point where you'll understand that, when you, that Christ is all that you need to have. So Paul is reminding them in this church, he's understanding who they are and reminding them that you don't need anything else. You have everything that you need in Christ. You see, the issue is, is that many people come to church hoping God will give them something. And, and this might fly right over your head, but all I'm saying is that, that people come to church with an expectation of saying, oh, God, I, I need something. I need something else that you could possibly give me. And, you know, but Jesus is saying, man, honestly, this is all, I'm all that you need. What you really need is more of Jesus. You need to have, let some things go that are, that are clouding in your life so you can have more of Christ in your life. Then you understand when you come to church, you won't be expecting something else. And you understand his fullness. You will understand uh, his love. You'll understand his plan for your life. And then you will realize all I really need is more of him. Uh, in Psalms 23, one of the most famous verses in the Bible, it says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. What else do you want? If you have the Lord, what else could you possibly want in this world? And so we go into Colossians, and we're going to do Colossians 1, uh, starting with verse 3. I'm reading out of the ESV version, so if you have your digital Bibles, you could, if you want to switch versions. Um, and it says this. It says, we always thank God. This is Paul talking. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love that you have for all saints. And we'll stop right there. It's an interesting question. When you go out into the community, uh, do you, do you ever, does people ever say anything about Awakened Church? What do people say about Awakened Church? I will say one thing. I was getting my car worked on at the Ford dealership, and the guy behind the counter knew who Jimmy Hurst was because I had an Awakened shirt on. And he goes, you go to Awaken Church? Jimmy goes to that church? I said, yeah, Jimmy goes to that church. Oh, I'll give you a discount. So I was like, I texted him, remember? I was like, Jimmy, you're everywhere. You're like the mafia. You're like, every, you got power over everyone. I don't know what it is. But he was asking me. He said, yeah, I've heard about your church. You know, I heard, I heard some things about your church. And I was like, well, what did you actually hear? <laughs> He's like, aren't you taking over the mall? I was like, yeah, not really. But that's, that's a good wish or dream or however it is. But you the funny thing is, one time when I was in the mall with the other pastor, Pastor Andrew, who used to be with us, uh, we had just started. It was like six months in, and a, a pastor, I guess, came into the mall and said, hey, I'm, I'm from Lake Wales, man. I, I just wanted to meet you guys. So we were like, oh, sure. We're new to the area. Can you come in? And he sat down with us, and he says, um, I'm not going to stay long, but I just want to tell you something. My church, we just want you guys to leave Lake Wales. And, I, and Andrew was like, why is that? He goes, well, let me just say, we're praying that you guys leave Lake Wales. 
And we're like, why? He says, because you preach in jeans. And you can't be honest truths. <laughs> like, you can't preach in jeans. You can't do that. That is against God's word. And I said, so that's what people are saying about us out in the community. Come to Awaken Church where the pastor preaches in jeans and converse. Uh, maybe that's the new thing. But it, it's, it's just amazing. It's amazing that it's, this is what is happening. But Paul is saying that, man, he has heard about the church of Colossians saying that they're just a bunch of people that love one another. And, and, and to be honest with you, I, I just, there's something on my heart that I just want to share that just frustrated me last week. Um, in, in Lakeland, they, uh, they, some newspaper took out, like, uh, they took out a poll and they wanted people to, to bounce around to different churches and grade their worship, uh, their worship set. And so they just were, and at first I was kind of like, well, that's interesting, you know, but then when you start reading stuff, like people were saying, um, they were just like, if you really want to experience God, our guitarist is the best in Lakeland. If you really want to experience God, the vocalist that we have in, in our church really brings heaven down. And it, it started to turn into this weird, my church is better than yours, and, and our musicians are better than your musicians. And I, and I just said, man, is that really what we want to be known for? I mean, why don't we just go ahead and start a survey and rate how our seats are? Do we have the most comfortable seats? Uh, maybe we can rate how the coffee tastes. I hope they don't come here and rate that, but... I'm just kidding. It's wonderful. And so, uh, but still, you know, it's like, why don't we just do that? So we could attract other people that go to different churches and go, oh, I want to go here because the coffee tastes better. Or they have different type of seats. Or they, they have this. Or they have this lead guitarist that is just exceptional. Because that is, you know, that's what I want. That's what I want. And is this what church is about? To have the best coffee or musicians or speaker, or anything like this, and is this what is happening to us here in America? That just It just bothered me. Now, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong, but it just bothered me because here's Paul saying to the church, he's like, man, you know what I heard about you? He's like, you just love people. He's like, you just love people, and it, and it just brought me to this point where I was like, man, I would love for that to be said about our church. I don't care how big we grow, how small we shrink, just to get around the community. You know what? That church loves people. They love people no matter what. They love people no matter what. And the pastor preaches in jeans. That's what I want them to say. And the coffee's 50-50, depending on who makes it. So that's just what, that would be an awesome thing. But don't we do that to ourselves? We look for churches like that. And don't we leave church? Like, don't people just leave churches for the same reasons? We leave because we don't like the songs they sing. We leave because the coffee's bad. They leave because the children's ministry is terrible. They leave because we want to find a place that makes us feel more comfortable, which starts a whole mentality of what can I get from God? What can I get out of church? What can I get? And it starts to point the fingers at ourselves, me, 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 and me. And don't get me wrong. We try to do our very best here at Awaken Church, and I'm sure the other churches do the same. And I'm not trying to put down any, any, any ministry or anything like that, but it's just kind of like, what are we actually looking for here? And we try to do our very best here at our church to put together the best of things we could possibly do for God's glory alone. Not mine, not the musicians, not the person who makes the coffee <laughs> or anything like that. But I would just love to be known as a place that loves everyone. Go up to verse 5. Paul says, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you as indeed the whole world, the whole world is bearing fruit and increasing. And it is also also does among you since the day you've heard it and understood the grace of God's truth. So Paul's explaining here why he's telling him this is why you love people so much. And the Colossians were known for accepting and bringing in all kinds of people where other churches were like, I don't want them in my church. I don't want them in. I don't like the way they look. I don't like the way they smell. I don't like this, I don't like that. And Colossians were like, no, 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 you come because we just love people. And Paul is saying in verse 5, the reason why these people love is because they have a heavenly perspective. It's because they are not thinking about the things of the world anymore. They are thinking eternally. And they were thinking that, man, these people will perish if we do not love on them, we are thinking more of heaven. And see, that's the thing that I am really 
pushing for all of us, especially the young people, um, when I meet with the young people at night, is that we have to change our perspective. We have to have a more heavenly mindset uh, perspective in everything that we do in life. But it's so easy for us to kind of creep back into the earthly perspective of comfort, things that I want, things that I want to accomplish, things that I want to do. While this church in Colossians is like, no, 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 we need to accomplish what God wants, what he wants us to do, where he wants us to go. It's a heavenly perspective. And everything that they've ever done, this church was thinking about heaven and eternity because they understood that this earth is only here for a short period of time and it will just come and go just like the wind. Have we lost that? Have we lost our heavenly perspective? Verse 7. It says, just as you learned it from uh, Epirus, excuse me, our beloved fellow servant, he is the pastor of this church. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, and he has made known to us your love in the Spirit. So this was the pastor that reached out to Paul and saying, uh, hey, I'm having just a little bit of issue here. Can you help us out? So this is why Paul is writing the letter. Verse 9. It says, and so from that day we heard... We have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. God's will. Paul prays that you'll be filled with the knowledge of his will. And let me ask you a question, because this was the verse I actually sat and struggled with a little bit uh, in just meditating on my own life and my own self is, and I, and I just, just think about it. You don't have to raise your hand or start, yell anything out loud, but be honest. Do you really want to know God's will for your life? Because God has a will for your life. I, I call it an adventure. God has an adventure for your life. But we grow up in this life where everybody has a will for your life. You know, my parents had a will for my life when I was growing up, what they wanted me to do and accomplish. And then you bump into other people who kind of say, oh, man, you should do this and do that. And sometimes we go to counseling, and the counselor has a will for your life. And, and parents do that to their children and so on and so on. And, and guidance counselors do this. And everybody has this will for our lives, you know. And they're just, they're just trying to guide you and direct you and say, oh, you'd be good at this, and let's do this, and let's do that. And so they all have this will. But at the end of the day, do we, just, do we really want God's will in our life? Because God's will in our life is something that is, is, can be extremely difficult. Jesus said these words. He says, if you want to be my disciple, you got to carry your cross and follow me. Jesus said that, that if you want to be with me, you have to surrender sometimes your will and your dreams just to follow me. Sometimes it means we have to put things that we really want aside because God's plans are coming through, and that's what he wants us to follow, not our own plans. And so the question is, have you ever really prayed that prayer, God, show me your will in my life? Because truthfully, it would be so much easier if you didn't know, right? I mean, honestly, it would be a lot easier. We could just play dumb and just say, I don't know what God's will in my life. I think he wants me to, like, watch TV and... You know, eat some pizza and, and just live a nice, comfortable life, and that's just going to be my will. And I, and I don't really want to, if I don't know God's will, then I can't mess it up, and I can't do all those things, and, and we could just play dumb. Um, but it, you just think about the people in the Bible who decided to go into God's will. Paul, who wrote this letter, do you think that's what he signed up for when he became a Christian? To be, he was beaten, Paul was put in jail, he was stoned, he was whipped. He was on a shipwreck. Uh, he had to stay. He stayed single his whole life. He had to work a part-time job. Every time he went into a different town, uh, there was people there that just wanted to kill him. I mean, honestly, that's not really the job that you want to sign up for, you know, when you're searching for a job or anything, or, or that's not what we sign up for to be a Christian. Do you think that's what Paul really was excited about when he knew those things were happening? No, but because it was God's will, he decided to, that's what he was going to do. He went through all this for God's will. Paul traveled the world to bring the gospel because he was heavenly minded and because he wanted God's will over his own. And it was a challenge for him, and it is a challenge for us. The thing is, we have to ask ourselves a question, what are we afraid of, of God's will? Well, many people are like, I don't know, I don't want to know God's will in my life because he might make me move. He might make me go somewhere. Maybe he might have me pack up everything I have and go to Africa. 
Or maybe God's will is, oh, I got to get involved in the children's ministry. I just don't want to do that. <laughs> or maybe, maybe God's will for your life, he, he wants you to sell everything you have and give to the poor, like he told the rich young ruler. Or maybe God's will for your life is saying, I don't want you to, to, to buy those certain things anymore. Or maybe God's will for your life is, I don't want you to be with that man. I don't want you to be with that woman. I, don't want, you, I want you to be single for a while. Or maybe God's will is, is just saying, I, I need you to give up your dreams that you had just for a moment because I've got something better for you. And for many people that love the Lord, they worship God, they do everything, but ask him, what is God's will? What is God's will? I think a lot of it comes down to trust. Do we trust God that much that what he has for me is better than what I can create myself? But see, this is how we see things. We, we look at things backwards. We have to learn to be heavenly minded. The more you submit to Christ, the more fulfilled you will be. But see, we look at things differently. The more things that we can collect and the more fulfilled we think we will be. And listen here, I'm not saying let's just sit around and let's not do nothing. Uh, let's not buy anything anymore. Let's not go anywhere. Let's not do anything. That, that's not what I'm saying. It's saying is, will you surrender completely to God's will? Listen, the truth of the matter is, I look out into this, uh, all you amazing people, look at your smiles and everything. Some people look angry at me. That's okay. I'll look the other way. And I know God has given you some amazing gifts and talents. And you're not stepping into God's will to use them. Some of you are great musicians. God is saying, hey, I gave you that gift. I want you to use them. Some, some people in this room are great with money. You're just good with money and getting people out of debt and savings. Man, there's a lot of people in this church that could use your help. Some people are good with uh, putting, like, uh, job applications together and, and interviews, and there's people here that are looking for a job, and you're good at those things. Some people are good homemakers. Some people, some of you guys are, are kind of older than me. And you've been married for such a long time, and there's some of us younger people that could use some of your wisdom and knowledge, and that could be God's will in your life. And I hear it all the time is that we, we end up changing God's will for something better because I'm telling you, God's will is not for us to be lazy and to, in, in our fulfillment. God's will is not for us to start using excuses on why we can't use our gifts to help others. I hear it all the time. Um, people come to me all the time saying, I want to know more about God. I want to do more about this. And they're like, well, but first, I got I to gotta watch my TV and get my shows in. I got to get my fix. I got this one show I can't miss. You know, I got to watch The Walking Dead every Sunday. I'm sorry. God can wait for an hour or <laughs> whatever. But it's just like, then why would you come to me saying you want more of God? And listen, I'm not saying you can't watch TV or anything like that. But if you understand what God's will is for your life, then you'll know that he needs to be more involved in your life and everything that you're doing. But we're so afraid at times because God might tell us to do something we don't want to do. And this is a church I hope we grow together and become more heavenly minded around the, the people that are around us, even in our own place. I believe God wants us to advance in every area in life. I don't think he wants us to be stuck in debt, to be lazy, to be stuck in a job that we absolutely hate to do things in life that, that are just miserable. I don't believe that. I believe God always wants us to keep moving forward, and the more forward we move with him, this amazing adventure begins to open up. So you that have these amazing gifts, don't sit in the chairs anymore. People in this church are waiting. The world is waiting for you, and God is waiting to use these gifts. Look, verse 10. I'm almost done here. So as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. What a statement. Paul is saying, man, you walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. What does that even look like to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him? Because I know every single day of my life, I keep saying, man, I can do better. I can do better. I can do better. I can do better. But he pretty much breaks it down. He says, man, you need to start bearing fruit in, in every good work and increase in the knowledge of God. So Paul is saying, if you do those things, then you are walking in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. Listen, I'd be honest, personally, my frustrations with church in general, not Awaken Church, but overall, speaking with many pastors over the summer and, and missionaries that I went I had a strong frustration about church in general. 
where I, I, I talked to pastors where they were so afraid to preach truth and to preach gospel because they didn't want to lose people in their church and so afraid to step out in what God's will they have for them that they just, they just were like, well, you don't understand because if, if I lose people, then the offerings are going to go down. If the offering goes down, then I'm going to lose my salary. And if that happens, then my family's in trouble. So I'm just going to keep preaching it just, you know, just enough to keep them in the seats. And, and that's all I know what to do. And it just frustrates me because now we're filling churches with people that are just hearing uh, um, like a motivational speech. And we're coming in, we're filling up these churches, and we're just giving you a motivational speech and sending you out so you feel good about yourself for a day, and you come back next Sunday so I can hear another thing that pumps me up and ready to go. It's just like the worship survey. I'm just afraid that all that's going to do is pull people from other churches to bounce around and never really grow roots in God. And the truth of the matter is, I've been to places all over the world and I just, I remember my time in Kenya, the guy that was leading worship there, he had a guitar with two strings. And God's power was more present there than I think I've ever been. Anywhere I have ever been in America, anything that's had stage lights and smoke screens and all those things like that. And you just sit back and you go, man, have we lost something here? Have we lost something? Are we thinking heavenly minded? I'm going to ask the worship team to make their way up. As I close, verse 11, Paul gives a word of encouragement. He says, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father, verse 12, who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Verse 13, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us from the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. This is such a powerful statement where Paul is reminding this church what Christ has done. Listen, he's like, don't stop giving thanks to the father. We're going to share in his inheritance. And Warren Buffett and Bill Gates got nothing on God's inheritance for all of us. They got nothing. And when you really understand in verse 13 where he says, man, he delivered us from the domain of darkness. Basically saying there are people walking in our communities, in our workplaces that are walking in a state of darkness. And that's why they don't see the way you see things. That's why they don't understand the same things. It wouldn't be surprising if some people walk, even in this church, they're just walking in a state of darkness. And all I can say this is, is if you have been hurt by a previous church, I'm so sorry. And if you've been hurt by Christians pointing fingers at you and judging you, I am sorry. You will not get that at this place. We want to see everybody stop walking in this domain in darkness and transferred into his inheritance. Verse 14, again, it says, we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. When you understand how amazing that promise is, you'll understand who God is in your life, that we now redeemed. We no longer walk in this dark place. Our eyes are opened up. We start to see the world differently. We start to see our neighbors differently. We start to see people differently. You know, we're not on some, some campaign or anything, you just start to see people through God's eyes and his eyes are filled with love and truth and sometimes a hard love. This was the letter to the Colossians. As we go through the next few weeks, you'll understand even more. The truth of the matter is, is what Paul is trying to say is you need to be content of who Christ is in your life and get to know him more and more in your relationship with him. How do you do that? My suggestion is uh, Tim in the back found an awesome Bible plan that's on your app, a Colossians Bible plan. Man, start that plan. Just go ahead and register on your phone. Hit Colossians. It'll tell you when to read, what to read. It'll begin to explain things that me and Joe might not get to to teach you. We can all be on the same page. That's one thing. My, th my suggestion is get a notebook and start writing down prayer requests. And write them down. Ask God, what should I write down? This is what I do. 
Write down people's names that come to your mind, your family. Write down things that you're concerned about. Oh, I want to pray for the government. I want to pray for this community. I want to pray, you know, for Haiti. I want to pray for child. You just write those things down and start praying for those things. But I challenge you. I challenge some of you. Start praying every single day, God, what is your will for my life? If you feel up to it. He might tell you some things you don't want to hear. He might tell you, I need you to separate from this person. I need you to separate from that person. I need you to do this. I need you to talk to this person because there's something going on in their lives you don't understand. I need you to step up and serve in the church. I need you to do this. I need you to give more. I need you to be more generous. I want you to go on one of these crazy trips with Pastor Jay. I I want you to do it. And you're going to get opposition. And the the things are going to come. And people are going to talk bad about you. And all these things. They're going to point fingers at you. And they're going to say, you're the weird Christian in the back of the room. And I don't know about that person, and that could possibly happen. But man, when you walk in God's will and His fulfillment, there is no greater joy. I can guarantee you. There's there's no greater joy. Is it easy? Of course not. It's extremely difficult. And this is why Paul is encouraging this church because he understands how difficult it can be. Forgiving someone that hurts you is extremely difficult. It's extremely difficult. Stepping out of your comfort zone is extremely difficult. For some of us, turning off the television is extremely difficult. Giving up Starbucks and going to Dunkin' Donuts instead is extremely difficult. Deciding you want to give more when you don't have enough to give is extremely difficult. Being generous. I look at some of these people that go on these trips, man. They, they, some of them had absolutely nothing and God came through because they decided to walk faithfully with him in all aspects of life. So I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you. I challenge you every day. Pray, God, what is your will for me? What is your will for me? And if something comes up, man, hey, send me a message. I'd love to hear about it and say, wow, your life's going to be messed up. So congratulations. <laughs> no, no, I'm kidding. It's, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful life. My, my prayer is, too, is that I... I never want to be the pastor to give motivational speeches. I don't want to get caught. If that's where my life is heading, I'd rather not do it. Honestly, I'd rather just walk away. Because I'm so tired of seeing, and tired not in like a negative way, but seeing Christians that are walking with God in circles. It's like you're doing well with him, but you go back. Doing well with him, and you go back. Doing well with him, and you go back. I'm telling you, start walking forward. Even if it's just a few inches every day, your life will never be the same. Your life will never be the same. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for this day, Lord. I thank you for this amazing church family in front of me. I thank you for what you're doing in your life, Lord. And I pray, Lord, give them boldness to begin to ask for your will in their life. And I know it's not easy and I know it's difficult. And I know, Lord, there's people in their lives that they need to forgive, Lord. I know there's stuff in their life they need to let go. I know there's material things that they need to sell and get rid of. I know there's steps of faith that they're just dying to take, but they don't know where to go. Lord, I pray for boldness in their life. I pray for boldness in their life, that they will just take a chance. I pray, Lord, that they won't be afraid in worship to lift their hands. I pray, Lord, that they'll not be offended by a pastor wearing jeans when he preaches. I pray, Lord, that we can smile together as a family. I pray, Lord, that we can just be involved with each other and and hold each other up when we're falling. When this walk with you gets difficult, that we'll have people to lean on and hold up. I thank you for this amazing church. As As we give you all the glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' name. Amen.